the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 748 for Monday, February 11th, 2019. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Cab, the show where we take your questions, your tips, your cool stuff found, everything, our cool stuff found, all, all sorts of stuff. It doesn't matter. We just find it. You send it. We find it. We share it. Answers to the questions, sharing the tips, sharing the cool stuff found. It's like car talk for Apple users. Kids, ask your parents if the reference doesn't make sense, because the goal is for each of us to learn at least five new things every single time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash MGG and BB Edit from Barebones Software at barebones.com. We'll talk more about those later. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. How goes it today, Mr. John F. Braun? Yeah, yeah. I never know how you're going to answer that question. <laughs> well, that's, that's good. <laughs> that's, yeah. Like as I'm, so I, did solve, I, I did solve a mystery. Today. Every week as I'm asking it, I think I really shouldn't ask this question. But I do because, you know, it makes it interesting. So, oh, yeah, tell me. Okay, so you, you solved a mystery. What mystery did you solve? So we had for a few episodes, we were talking about the uh, mysterious system classification of storage, right? Which it turns out uh, is not as mysterious as we thought. Well, we 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 discovered one thing, but I was still having symptoms. Okay, so, as we pointed out, you have to be sure to get the in order for certain utilities to give you the right figures of free and taken space. You may have to add something to uh, uh, the privacy things. It, it, you have to terminal. run them the right way and or give them the right privacy, full disk access. That's that's yes. exactly it. Yeah, exactly. And the and thing is, I did that to, to be to just to close that loop. It, if you're using Daisy Disk, you just need to give it full disk access and and then scan as administrator and you're fine. If you're using Omni Disk Sweeper, also needs full disk access, uh. but. In order to scan as administrator, you have to do it from the terminal, which means terminal needs full disk access. And that was sort of the missing piece for both you and me. Anyway, yeah. so the th thing just is, to I got, catch people up. So by doing the terminal thing, I got numbers that were more accurate, but I still system was still taking up lots of space. Wait, the thing yeah. is, I was not getting the amount of free space that um, that was reported in okay. the utility. OK, what the heck? So, you know, I. <sighs> I just decided to, you know, do a Hail Mary. So what did I do? I went into recovery and I reinstalled Mac OS, which, uh, as some of you may know, will download the latest version and then install it over your current installation. Or that's one way of doing it. OK, so, so you didn't can pave, but you, it's a reinstall of the, the OS, again, with the assumption being that it's going to download the latest yeah. revision and apply it. And the thing is, so I, I did that a couple of days ago and all of a sudden, Dave. I went from having 177 gigabytes free on my drive to having 347 free. And the size of system went from 338 gigabytes to 169. What so, did you something? Huh. Did you try booting in safe mode before you did the whole maintenance reinstall over the top? I, I tried. And the thing is, when I tried to, to boot into safe mode, yeah, it would do it. You know, to boot in safe mode, you hold down the shift key. And as, as some people know, that fixes a lot of things. The thing is, it would never successfully complete that. The bar would, the, the progress bar would get all the way to the right and then just sit there and do nothing. And okay. So there was some cache file so, or something. That, so maybe that did it or the reinstall of the OS did it. Oh, One I see. One of the two. Yeah, right. The thing is, right. And the thing is, I recall, I had a lot of old, um, iOS device backups. And when I deleted them, I noticed that the, you know, it wasn't freeing up the space. And then I think it considers those system files. So I don't know if it was running safe mode, even though it didn't boot me into the, the desktop, yeah. it did something. So maybe it cleaned something up. It, it, it does. It's supposed to rather clean things up. It's supposed to clean out your cache files and, and it rebuilds your boot caches and, 
runs so maintenance been, scripts. So yeah, it could have been that. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, Reinst- reinstalling the OS, I think also when it realizes, hey, you know, I, I just got reinstalled, that I think also may do some. It does. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Re- constituting of, you know, cache files and, and stuff like that. But um, I like it. Cool. Well, I'm glad to hear that, man. That's great. And I'm with you. And we have uh, we have some agreement here from our friend Brian Monroe in our chat room. Where is our chat room, Dave? Oh, MacGeekGab.com slash stream, you might ask. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Where you can uh, join along. But yeah, so there was some cache somewhere that got reset by one of the things that I did. So sometimes you just got to keep throwing things against the wall and one of them will stick, right? <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's well, I, I mean, <laughs> that's that's the, that's the very colloquial colloquial. Easy for me to say way of uh, describing the troubleshooting process, right? It's just do one thing at a time. And, y- you know, obviously you want to do things that you think will help. But sometimes they don't and you just don't give up bullheaded persistence and, and just marching down the path. So, yeah, that's great. Cool. Yeah. I'm glad. So maybe it's something they fixed. And because the, as you probably saw, we got a uh, 10.14.3 supplemental update two just came out recently. It feels like they, they captain's log on next generation or something like that's. A yeah, they weren't very specific. Thing. And I haven't seen a supplemental in a while that yeah. they maintain the same version number, but they say, oh, well, this is kind of version two of this. OK, just just with all this. So, yeah, maybe that fixed it. Yeah. One, one of one of them or, or it just. Was a random thing, but just thought I'd share that because it was bothering me because I was running out of free space. And I yeah, no, you shouldn't space. be running out of free space. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, you don't well, want especially to when I delete things and it doesn't free the space up. Right. That's the, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. And also, as pointed out, Brian Monroe said they uh, they fixed the uh, a small FaceTime uh, security bug that you may have heard about. Right. <laughs> no, that that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, we have some cool stuff found. So let's go through that. Tom shares first. He says, I don't remember the podcast number you guys were where you guys were talking about the Quick Look plugins, but I have a great plugin that I use all the time and love. It's called Better Zip. It allows you to get a quick listing of the contents of a zip file without having to unzip it. It just peers in there. You select the zip file in the finder and hit the space bar. A list of the contents of the archive is shown. It's great to be able to do this when you are trying to see if a file exists in an archive and don't want to unzip it to find out. And he, of course, ended his email by saying it's free and then followed it up with a new email saying, uh... It used to be free, but it looks like it's still free. I don't know. It, a free download is available. Maybe maybe you have to pay afterwards. Maybe it's a uh, trialware or something. So thanks, Tom. That's great. Awesome. Very, very good. I had the opportunity at CES to check out this. Uh, what's It's called the Navitas Mu, or it's a Navitas-based technology in this Mu-1 charger, Navitas Semiconductor is making um, what they what they call their GAN fast uh, integrated circuits that um, use uh, gallium nitride in their power hub. So what this is, I've talked a lot about what's inside it. What it is is it's a um, it, you plug it into the wall. It's a power delivery uh, uh, charger, like you know, wall wart. But it's not a wall wart. That's the thing. It's super thin. It's way smaller than like even Apple's 30 watt uh, charger brick. And it's uh, it's a 45 watt charger brick, 14 millimeters thick. It folds flat in. You plug it into the wall. You can plug your USB-C cable into it to charge whatever it is you want to charge your, you know, your MacBook or your iPad or whatever you got. Or if you've got a one of the, you know, USB-C to lightning cables. You can charge your iPhones with that and they'll actually charge a little bit. They'll charge as fast as the iPhone will safely allow, which is cool. But, um, but yeah, this thing, like it's so tiny and lightweight. As soon as I got it, it was like, Oh, this is the one that's going in my travel bag. Cause I don't have to think about it. It's always there. It's not big. It's not bulky. Um, so you can, you can get them. I guess they are available now. You can pre-order, um, they did a Kickstarter, but now they've got an Indiegogo that will, uh, allow you to buy them. And I think they ship maybe next month or something for like 65 bucks. So 
Um, pretty cool little thing. So put a link in the show notes for you. You can go check that out. Pretty good, huh, John? Did you did you check those out at CES or or no? I don't know if I saw these guys. Now, is this? I'm I'm looking at the the picture of it. Does it have? Are there prongs in it? Does it plug into the wall? Yeah, it plugs into the wall. It actually comes with uh, it, you, it's it's you know what I would call a universal power adapter. So it comes with I think an EU plug in, a UK plug in, a US plug in. And something else. And you can they're 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 mod it's modular, so you can pop these things on it. Which means that there is actually, quote unquote, wasted space in this because if it weren't modular, you could actually make it even a little bit smaller because you don't need the little connectors and stuff to you know to do that. So yeah, it's it's a pretty cool thing. So when you look at it on Indiegogo, you'll see it, it looks like there's three pieces. There's actually four. And one of them is connected to the the main brick, and then the other two are are what you would use if you were in you know different countries or whatever. So yeah, it's pretty cool. I like it. Very nice seeing people taking advantage of new tech, all that good stuff. While we're on the subject of chargers and tech and all of that stuff, uh, Jeremy writes. Listening to episode 746, he says, you mentioned Doji. He says, I looked around their site and there was a picture for new arrivals. I didn't realize it was an ad for another site when I clicked it. But in any event, I was looking around and found something that some listeners might like. People were upset when MagSafe was taken away. But I found this little thing at DX.com that replaces it for USB-C devices. And it is. It's an elbow uh, connector, which means it's got a little, you know, right angle in it uh, that plugs into you. It's got two pieces. So one piece plugs into your USB-C port and gives it its own sort of MagSafe thing. And then the other piece is um, um, uh, the other part of the MagSafe and another USB-C plug on a right angle. So you can plug in and and you're good to go. And now you've got MagSafe on one of your USB-C ports. The downside of course, is that you're dedicating one of your USB-C ports to this, unless you pull out the little the little stub that's in there, which is fine. But ten bucks, little uh, magnetic elbow, which is awesome. I like it. Oh, look at that! And it looks like it doesn't infringe on any Apple patents, so they're not going to get sued out of existence. Right? It, yeah, it's not MagSafe, but it's MagSafe-ish. MagSafe like. Yeah, I mean, I see. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I see the. You know, they have like five contacts and. Yeah, but they're they're not using the same configuration. Hey, that's, uh, uh, oh, that's yeah, cool. I, I think uh, I, I think we can all say that we've at least once taken advantage of MagSafe. I know I have <laughs> taken advantage of, like thanked our lucky stars for, is the right yeah, my translation didn't of that. Go crashing yeah. to the ground. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I have been, you know, I'm a a mesh Wi-Fi junkie, John. It's uh, it's part of my stock and trade the last guru, few years here. I would say. Oh, guru, guru that's guru. better than you, junkie. You, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I would say you qualify as a guru because I think you've used everyone that's out there, and now there's one more. And well, there's always been more, right? You know, mm. but um, but yeah. So I started all the mesh Wi-Fi stuff that we've talked about on this show. You know, the Eero, the the Orbi, the Plume. The Velop uh, and countless others uh, have are all what I would would call consumer focused mesh. And then there's enterprise grade mesh, right? Like the, the high end stuff that Ubiquity makes and other companies make it, too. I think, uh, oh, the name was at the tip of my tongue. It begins with an R and several of you out there are right now are yelling at your uh, car radios or whatever, because you're helping me along with this, but it's not going to work. So, uh, but anyway, there, you know, there's several companies that make enterprise grade stuff. Um, Ubiquity being one of them. Well, Ubiquity also makes something that lives in what I would call the middle. Uh, it's prosumer mesh Wi-Fi, or really prosumer routing gear that happens to also include wireless access points that can be used in a mesh type scenario. And, uh, and it's called Unify, U-N-I-F-I. So uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to play with this stuff for the last couple of weeks, and I'm not quite ready to, to like weigh judgment on, on it yet in terms of whether I think it's better or worse. It's, it's, it's interesting. And in many ways it's better. Like it, it's, 
But in, in many ways, it's also far more confusing. And that's sort of the point of prosumer stuff is for the right person. It's the right thing. It's all very modular. So the interesting part about this is you don't buy like when you, we and we've talked about this on the show, right, John, when you buy a router, really what you're getting is three devices in one. You're getting your router that routes data. You're getting a wireless access point in there, right? With most routers and you're getting a switch so that you can plug multiple ethernet devices into these things, right? So this is a three in one device. And that's how most consumer grade rout routers are. It's how most mesh setups are because you're going to need all of those things. So why, you know, ask you to buy and manage different devices. Unify actually goes the other direction. Everything is modular. So you get a router or what they call the Unify security gateway. That's all it does is route traffic, right? And, uh, and it's got, you know, an ethernet port for the WAN an ethernet port for the LAN. It's got some others on it too, for management and things like that, but that's it. If you want Wi-Fi, then you add uh, Unify's Wi-Fi access points. I've got a few of the what their newer ones, which are the Nano HD ones, which are four by four radios or four by four five gigahertz radios, and I think two by two two point four gigahertz radios, and they can be connected over Ethernet or connected. Uh, you know, they can mesh with each other. Obviously, one of them has to be connected via Ethernet to the security gateway; otherwise, it doesn't work. And then they have managed switches, Unify switches of different sizes and stuff. One of the cool parts about this, again, depending on your setup, it's either cool or not cool, is the access points run only on power over Ethernet. So you plug exactly one thing into them, and that's an Ethernet cable. Uh, it doesn't necessarily, as I said, have to go all the way back to the switch or to the, the security gateway slash router because... Uh, they can do it. They can connect to each other over Wi-Fi, but that's also how it gets its power. And their switches can provide power over Ethernet so you can do it all in one. And that can be a very powerful thing or a very frustrating thing, again, depending on your setup. But it's all very modular. You pick the right things for your setup. And then uh, and then if you want to access it all remotely, in fact, if you want to access it at all, the router doesn't have a web management interface in it. In fact, it doesn't have any kind of interface in it at all. Um, mostly it has a, a small one, but if you want to do any management, you have to run a device that has the management interface on it that you can connect to. You can run this on your Mac. You can run it on, you know, a windows machine. You can run it on all manner of things, or you can get what they call their cloud key, which is a device that, runs the management interface and make sure you can get remote access and all of that good stuff. Once you are in the interface, it's awesome because you've got visibility into everything all at once, all your devices, all your access points. You can build a dashboard custom with all your cool stuff. Uh, you will pay a little more for this. Again, it really depends because you're buying everything modularly, but you'll probably wind up paying a little bit more than you would for sort of a consumer grade, you know, mesh system with a few mesh units or whatever. But um, but it's a pretty cool thing. And like I said, I, I, I kind of wanted to pave the way here. I'm sure we'll talk about it more. But uh, but that's that's how it that's how it works. And it works quite well. Um, speeds are, you know, I can again in the right range and all that stuff. I can get you know, over 500 megabits a second on my iPhone, which is only a two by two device. So that's, you know, about the fastest the iPhone could possibly go wirelessly. Uh, and it seems to work fine. And, you know, it roams between them and you can turn on all the fast roaming or turn that off if you have devices that have problems with it and really, you know, control things at a very granular level. It's a pretty cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. Brian Monroe saved me on that last thing with the R and the steering wheel. It's ruckus is the, uh, so hopefully many of you didn't too many, not too many of you created a ruckus trying to tell me what that was. So thank you, Brian Monroe. So any An thoughts on this, John, now that I've explained this a little bit, any, uh, you, you want to poke some holes or ask some questions about how this all works? No. Um, I mean, I get what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's definitely looking at it. I mean, it's rack mount components and stuff like that, or it looks like a lot of it. Well, is. Some of so, it uh, could be. None of the stuff I have is. 
it, it does not have to be. Um, but there are some things that are, again, it sort of depends on what modules you want to buy. Um, like the yeah. security gateway I have is most definitely not a rack mount component. Component. It's a tiny little thing that's probably about the size of like an Eero. Um, it's, it's smaller than the Wi-Fi access points, actually. It's just got four little ports on it. It's it's kind of crazy. The, the stuff, but the stuff is, yeah, it's it's built to be. No, I like how they segment it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you that it looks very uh, prosumer. It, and that's okay. what it's supposed to be. Yeah, they're they're not they're not trying to build this as anything any, anything else. In fact, that's exactly what they you know what they're aiming is the prosumer market. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a it's an interesting play, and you know, and and of course they have their own consumer grade mesh product called Amplify, which we've talked about and been very impressed with here. And we even said, you know, when when we first talked about it, that you know it came from Ubiquity, which was making enterprise grade Wi Fi for ever. And and this Unify stuff, mm -hmm. I think to be fair, this Unify stuff could very well be considered enterprise grade Wi Fi uh, or enterprise grade networking gear. Uh, for sure. It's just also the kind of thing that could work in your home. And I've met many of you over the years that have used uh, over the past couple of years, anyway, that have used Unify uh, in your homes and, and very happy with it. So yeah, it, it can work in small offices in your home or in large configurations too. So yeah, it's pretty, no, but I like the markets they address. So, you know, the, you, you can see, I mean, on their page here. So of course they do Wi-Fi, as you mentioned, security gateways, Switches, I mean, that's kind of a commodity these days, but the remote management, that's really nice, Yeah, you know, so so it would definitely be for, you know, I would think like a small office or something like that. But then also they they dip their toe into the, uh, the they have cameras and LED lighting from what I see here. So there's some smart home aspects as well. And that's the next you know, part is I've got a few of their cameras here, too. And I, I figured we'd pave the way with the with the networking stuff and then uh, maybe in a in the next episode or, or, you know, the next couple of episodes, we'll revisit this and talk about the cameras and how those work and all of that stuff too. Yep. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Lots of stuff out there. We've also got the, um, now how about how much, uh, how much, um, coin would you have to spend on these things here? That, that, uh, that's a good question. Uh, yep. Off, off top of your head. <laughs> yeah, no. So the security gateway that I have is, uh, the $139, right? So that's your router. Oh, all right. Well, then, well, that's just a start to be fair, uh -huh. right? <laughs> the Wi-Fi points that I have are high powered Wi-Fi points. Pro most people probably would only need two of these in their home. That's the nano HD. And, and those are 179 bucks a piece. Um, so, you know, you're at what, 358 plus 139. So you're at about 500 bucks. You may or may not need a switch. The good thing is these nano HD units come with what they call power over ethernet injectors, which means that they can provide their own power. Like you don't have to have a switch that provides power over ethernet to use these. It, obviously you could, and it makes it a little simpler, but you can just take your ethernet cable and plug it into this thing that goes into the wall and it gives your access point power. So you're fine there. Uh, you could be done at that point. You'd probably be happier though, getting a, um, a cloud key, which is the thing that lets you, you know, kind of runs the management software. And that's another hundred bucks. Um, depending on which one you get. If you want the one with the cameras, I think that's uh, the cloud key gen two. And I'm looking at the price here. I think that's 120 or $130. So you're, you're in like the $600 range to get a setup like this in your home. Uh, so, I mean, it's more than you would spend on say, uh, you know, a, a low grade Eero or Velop system, but not that much more than you'd spend for, you know, a higher end Eero system. Eero, speaking of which, just moments before we started recording, uh, the announcement came out that Amazon had bought Eero. So that gets interesting. So, yeah. Fascinating. We'll, yeah, we'll have to never, see. Never, never danced with these guys. How long have they been? Uh, uh, yeah. Never it, been on my radar. Oh, really? They yeah. They, what, they, whatever they're doing. They've been doing this for decades. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And their their amplify system for a mesh system is uh, is quite fantastic. It's they're the ones they were the first ones to come out with the plug directly into the wall access point or mesh point. They called it um, 
you know, it, 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 units to, to work with the mesh. They were, they were the first to do that kind of model and, and mm. their, their stuff works well. It's um, their radios are all three by three in those units, which is better than, uh, you know, most of the rest of them are all two by two. So yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Cool. All right. Yavol. Yavol. Yeah. So it, it'll be interesting to see, especially with the, the looping back on this Amazon purchase here. Uh, curious to see what happens to, to Eero. I mean, it's not surprising. They were a VC funded company. So, you know, an exit was always in the cards. Uh, I, I suppose there are worse acquirers than Amazon from a, from I, certainly from their standpoint, I'm sure it worked out great. I'm, I mean that from our standpoint as consumers that want to use this stuff. So uh, I, my guess is they'll Amazon will keep this brand alive uh, in a good way. I hope so, but there are others, you know, like I said, there's lots of options out there. So if Eero winds yeah. up getting screwed by this Amazon, or if we wind up getting screwed by this, I'm sure Eero doesn't get screwed. If we wind up getting screwed by this Amazon acquisition of Eero, there's other options. But I, I don't anticipate that. I have no reason to think that that would be the issue. No, Amazon has a pretty good track record of not ruining things with their acquisitions. At right. Least that's been my view. Unlike Google, right? I mean, right. come on. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, exactly. they acquire things and then shut them down. It's like, guys, come on. Well, yeah, thanks for doing that. Do that. Yeah, yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> no, nope. right, one, of one last cool stuff. Yeah, there are a couple things that that Google has done that are acquired that have worked out well. Like Google Voice, right? They bought what was it? Global something? Global Dial? I can't remember the name. Thank you for banging on your steering wheel and trying to tell me. But um, you know, Google Voice has turned out to be fantastic, right? So, speaking of which, you know, I, I'm. I, we'll talk more about this in the next episode because I, I'll, I'm not quite finished with the transition. But we just migrated away from having our home, quote unquote, home phone number on uh, Comcast because, or Xfinity because they did away with their triple play plans. And they were going to charge us $24 a month to keep our phone line, you know, our VoIP line through them. And it was like, yeah, so for $20, mm -hmm. I can port a number into Google Voice and for but you can't port directly from Xfinity to Google Voice. But what you can do is port from Google Voice to a cell carrier like T-Mobile, who lets you have a three dollar a month plan. And that's all we needed. So for twenty three dollars and about four days worth of time, we've now taken our phone number out of Xfinity and it is a Google Voice number. And we'll we're using a cool stuff found the OB 200 from a previous episode that hasn't arrived yet. But um, I ordered it today, actually. And we'll we'll use that to connect it yeah. to our phones. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to make a decision soon. So I did like you, uh, 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 cable vision or optimum or yeah. whatever they're called this week. Um, some big company acquired them, too. Was it? Uh, I'll remember later. Sure. But, um, anyway, no. Uh, my landline, I had Frontier, yeah. but I upgraded it. But I got a deal. So it's $14.95 a month, but it's only for a year. Then they're going to jack it up to $34, which is more <laughs> than you're paying for. Now, the thing is, I mean, it's unlimited U.S. calling. And then, you know, kind of, you know, you get a pretty good deal calling other countries. Not that I call other countries. That yeah, much. but Google Voice is free, man. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but I'm, the thing is, I'm, I'm going to have to do the dance with them at some point. Because I'm sure when it, you know, they jack up the price. I'm going to call them and say, okay, what deals you got now? Even at $14.99 a month, it's not worth it. You, it no. let, let, let yeah, me. For me, it is. For me, it is versus the price I paid Frontier, formerly AT&T, for a landline. So. Right, but I'm saying that you can convert. So let's have this conversation, right? So it, my conversion in the end will cost me $73 in one-time fees. And those mm -hmm. fees are... I paid three dollars to T-Mobile to buy a, a or not to buy actually so sorry eighty three dollars. I paid ten dollars to buy the T-Mobile SIM. I then paid three dollars to activate that T-Mobile SIM um, on a three dollar a month plan, which I only needed for a few days, and that gives me thirty minutes or thirty messages. And I didn't need either of those. I just needed an active line. And when I activated it, I put in our quote unquote landline number, which is our Xfinity number. It took about two days, and then I got the email saying, yep, you're good to go. I made two phone calls, one from the, the iPhone that I'd plugged this T-Mobile SIM into and one to it to make sure that the phone number truly went that way. And then it was like, I was satisfied. Great. No problem. Good. 
Then I created a Google Voice account for free. And then I transferred that T-Mobile number into Google Voice because you can't transfer an Xfinity number to Google Voice. So once it was a T-Mobile number, I could transfer that to Google Voice. That Google charged me $20 to do. And and now I'm done. That's where I am at this point in time. So I have a phone number that is in Google Voice, but it is my landline mm-hmm. number that we've had for years that we wanted to preserve. Mm-hmm. Um now we are choo- now from there we could be finished and just have this Google voice number forward to our cell phones uh, and we can have it forward to all of our phones or none of them, etc. Uh, what we are choosing to do is in the last episode, and this is part of what inspired me to do this. We talked about the OB 200, which is uh, this device that plugs into your Internet, you know, plugs via Ethernet. And will take your Google voice line and VoIP it for you and give you an RJ11 port, which is your standard phone point. And so that costs 50 bucks. One, again, one time fee. Our friend Steve, Mr. Comlink, uh, had, was the one that suggested that. And hmm. uh, yep. And then uh, and then that's it. And, and so we will be finished. There will be no more monthly fees. Eighty three dollars in. And so, you know, eighty three divided by twenty four within four months, we've paid it back. And we will never pay again unless Google decides to start charging for, you know, Google voice, uh, which they could, but uh, they aren't. So I really am uh-huh. only taking a four month gamble and that's that. So, yeah, okay. I highly recommend it, man. If you're already on a VoIP line, what's the difference? You know, might as well stop paying. So that's my theory anyway. Well, I could stop paying, but. Hmm. Endless but you might as well keep the lo- keep the number. Like if people have that number for you, which is true for us well, here. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. have two numbers, the landline number that I've had forever and a cell phone that I've had forever. Yep. Yep. So, um, yep. All right. But no, it'll, there'll come a point where I have to, again, do the yearly dance with the cable company and say, okay, what deals you got now? Yeah. It was and- kind of annoying because all of a sudden, uh, so the thing is I actually, uh, the, the one nice thing with their bill pay is that it alerts you if the, if it's over a certain amount. And all of a sudden I got an alert saying, oh, this is over the amount that you authorized. And then I'm like, oh, the free HBO and Showtime you gave me, you're now charging me for them. Hey, thanks. It's like the last deal I did with them, I supposedly got free HBO and Showtime. And I there's not really any shows on either of those channels that I really want to watch. Um, but um, all of a sudden, yeah, my bill increased by like, you know, 20 bucks because they were not charging me for those channels. And I'm like, nope, nope. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Yep, exactly. Yeah, you do need to do that that yearly dance. All right, All one right. last cool stuff found. Uh, and this comes from listener Brian. And uh, Brian writes uh, and says, I don't know if you've talked about QuickNAS. Uh, and this comes from uh, DosDude1.com, which is the place that we talked about last week, maybe two weeks ago, that has the... Uh, software to let you install Mojave and High Sierra and Sierra on Macs that don't technically wow. support it. Yeah. This guy's so, good. Yeah, he is good. Yes. QuickNAS is a simple menu bar based, based Mac OS uh, application that allows for quick and easy connecting of network attached storage devices. And it does. It looks pretty cool, actually. Um, it allows you, if you want to connect to your NAS devices, you sort of set it up and then you've just got them right there in your uh, in your menu bar and you just choose it and you're good to go. So, yeah, the handy little tip. We'll uh, we'll throw it out there. Thanks for that, Brian. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. Cool. Hey, uh, I want to take a minute and talk about our first sponsor, John, which is Express VPN. I think we all know why we want a VPN here, but I'm going to rehash that for a quick moment anyway. If you ever use the internet, Wi-Fi, especially in coffee shops, hotels, restaurants, it doesn't matter. Somewhere else where you don't know who manages that Wi-Fi, and especially if it's Wi-Fi that doesn't have a password, anyone could be sniffing that data. At the very least, they could be seeing what sites you're going to, how you're getting there, all of that stuff. And maybe, just maybe, even be able to sniff like the data that's going, including passwords and all of that. This is not okay. And this is why you want ExpressVPN, because ExpressVPN creates a tunnel 
between your computer or your iPhone or your iPad or your whatever tablet doesn't matter, creates a tunnel between your computer and the outside world. So all anyone could see, even if they looked really, really hard, is that you're connecting to ExpressVPN. That's it. They don't know what websites. They certainly can't see your passwords or your data, your email or anything else going back and forth. And you are covered. I've been using ExpressVPN for about the last two months here. We used it while we were at CES. Freaking awesome. It works one click. It's super, super fast. And it just works and it protects you. And it's smart. It'll figure out how to connect to the right closest server to get you the fastest speed. And here's even a cool part. If you have one app that say you don't want to be VPN, like maybe you want a browser that is just local. Maybe you want it to connect to the hotels network or, you know, whatever it is, you just, you can tell the app on your Mac, don't make this app part of the VPN, or you can flip it around and say, only make this app part of the VPN. So if you just want one browser on the VPN and the other stuff that you're doing, not you get to pick. It's super flexible and super cool. And it costs less than seven bucks a month. And it's not just my favorite VPN. It's Tech Radar's number one rated VPN service. And it has a 30 day money back guarantee. ExpressVPN is what you want. So protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months for free at expressvpn.com slash MGG. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash MGG for three months free with a one year package. One more time with feeling expressvpn.com slash MGG to learn more. Our thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor, John is BB edit from Barebones software. We love BB edit. And you know, the reason we love BB edit is because it does what it's supposed to do. It is a text editor. I know that sounds crazy to be happy about a text editor, but we love BB edit as a text editor because it's so smooth at what it does. I have it running all the time on my computers. I use it as we're doing this show to manage all the chapters and everything because it just works in text. I don't have to worry about little formatting things getting messed up in there. I get to see characters aligned as they're supposed to be. I get to count words. It's right there. I can compare two files to see what the difference is. And all of those things are available in the freely available version of BB edit. There are some advanced features that you can pay for, but just try out the free version. That's the place to start. You can do a lot of coding with the free version. You can connect to uh, servers and pull your files down. It BB edit is awesome. So go check it out. Go to barebones.com and download your trial copy of BB edit today. When the trial ends, it turns into a free copy of BB edit. It doesn't stop working. So chances are most of the things, maybe all the things you do are available in that free version. Go check it out just right now. Barebones.com download BB edit. That way you've got it. You can have it running all the time. Like I do and your life can get better. Our thanks to barebones for making BB edit and for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, let's, uh, let's go to some questions. Shall we? Should we start with Greg here? Does that work for you? Sure. Okay. Yes. I wasn't sure if I lost you. Okay. Good. Stuff. good. No, no, no. We're here. Okay, We're good. Here. Well, I know sometimes we have connection issues, so. All right. Well, uh, I did. Oh, you did. Well, okay. Well, welcome back. Greg. I, I wasn't going to tell you that, but I, yeah. I, I, I had a feeling. I had a feel. So that answers the question. You need to plug your audio device directly into your Mac. I, I, I am certain that, that I'm not certain, but I'm 99% certain that the problem you keep having is that because discord is very finicky it's plugged into a hub. Yeah. Okay. If discord, uh, which is the discord's the app that, that John and I use to, so that we, we can hear each other. Uh, it's, it's where the audio okay. goes. And it did report and I had to dismiss it on the top of my screen. It says, Oh, I'm not hearing you. The thing is this happened like 10 seconds ago. Right. <laughs> Where right. I was hearing you and you were hearing me, but Discord on my computer that's was saying, different. I don't hear anything. And I'm like, huh? I think that's, I've seen that too. That's, that's, that's a different quirk of Discord. No, it's when, when you change audio devices while Discord is running, um, Discord will not 
hear the audio or play the audio too, depending on if it's your input or output device, uh, a new device that you change to, you need to quit discord and relaunch it. And then it will accept the new device. So with that in mind, I think what's happening is your device is going offline and online very, very quickly, probably because of, you know, it's connected to this hub, which audio devices should never be. Uh, and, and, and that's what's causing you to just stop hearing me because you're hearing me out through discord. Um, and, and, and for the record, for those of you following along audio devices, audio is a real time, uh, operation right and i know that sounds obvious to say but uh usb is not a real time uh uh, uh it doesn't allow for it it queues up things right it it's not a um it's not it's not an isochronous connection where things happen in time predictably usb kind of cues things and sends them and cues them and sends them so the more interference or the more devices you have between the computer and the end of the chain i.e your audio interface the more opportunities there are for things to get bogged down by usb so usb really should never be used for audio is is really the truth but it's what we use for audio most of the time. It's why FireWire is better for audio, but um, but right because the protocol is isochronous for re- various reasons. Yes, yes. correct. Yeah, and re- reliably deliver Ex- data exactly, yeah. exactly in a timely manner, kind of like TCP/IP versus UDP, right? Um, yeah, in a sense, I think that's yeah, I, yes. If you sure. want to geek out here, and I'll, I'll tell you a short joke and then we'll continue here. But um, a UDP packet walks into a bar and nobody acknowledges him. So he leaves. That's right. But everybody might have seen him anyway, because UDP packets are never acknowledged. acknowledged. That's right. So, yeah. Sorry, I, I had to explain UDP your packet. joke so that it, you know, so that it tied into the conversation. Nobody got that. Well, one or two people got it. OK, sorry. Continue. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I think if you plug in that this might be the last of those issues, hopefully we make it through the show without it uh, being an issue. All right, All right. I will re-architect my uh, my USB setup in order to put something. Now, I am going to do the best segue that you could possibly imagine, because one way you could re-architect it, if you don't have a spare USB port on your computer, your computer is Thunderbolt capable and so you could p- plug in a Thunderbolt to USB dock that or a Thunderbolt dock that has a USB port on it. And that USB port is also now pretty much native to your computer because Thunderbolt really just plugs directly into the motherboard. And what am I going to do? Because I, I already have a display port thing plugged into my mini. Well, you could go. Uh, so I could. It, could I plug? because the connector on this machine for Thunderbolt and DisplayPort is the same connector. Right. I'm just using it as a display right now. So could I get a, so if I got a dock that would accommodate. Correct. You could have a dock that then has a display port on it and plug your display into the dock and, and then you're good to go. Yeah. yeah, Doc, who would I go to for that? Huh? Well, OWC? that's you see OWC oh, makes a great Thunderbolt two dock. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, I have OWC's Thunderbolt two dock on my Mac downstairs uh, oh, in do? the office. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, cause that's my 2014 Mac, which is a Thunderbolt two. I've got Even the Thunderbolt time. three that I use Thunderbolt three dock that I okay. use with my, um, uh, uh, with my new MacBook air. Uh, and then I've also got a Cal digit Thunderbolt two dock that sits up here in the studio and adds some USB ports All right. that I needed. And the nice part is it adds USB three ports even though this computer is not usb3 native but with thunderbolt it can be and that brings us to greg's question greg says i'm trying to pick a hub for the 2018 macbook pro that i have i want to connect one cable to hook up my charger gigabit ethernet an external display or two and two or three external usb devices with usb a connectors I plan to get two hubs, one for the office and one for home. So it'd be great to use USB-C to keep the price down. 
Thanks to Mac Keycab, I know that USB-C hubs support transfer speeds up to 10 gigabits, while Thunderbolt 3 supports up to 40 gigabits. I don't know whether those transfer speeds include the bandwidth needed to drive the displays. In practice, if I'm using a USB-C hub to drive a display or two, will that slow down the read-write speeds from the external USB USB devices or the gigabit Ethernet? Um, so I'm not sure what USB-C hub you would use to do all of these things. You should be able, like in theory, I think you'd be okay either way. Um, but I'm not sure what USB-C, I'm looking at OWC's USB-C hub here uh, because that would be the first place I would go. And so we'll call it the USB-C dock, which is really a better uh a better way. And uh, let's see the, the OWC USB-C dock is how much is it? Where is it? 119 bucks. So yeah, that saves you a bunch of money. It has three, four USB-A ports on it. Okay. That's good. It's got um, two USB-C ports on it. One of which you have to plug back into the computer. So you get another one. Uh, it's got an HDMI port on it and it's got gigabit ethernet. So that would let you drive one display. Oh, and, and, uh, it has, oh no, you can either get one with HDMI or with mini display port. So you can't get one from OWC with both. So that device might not do it for you, but it might, because you could also just get, uh, you know, your, your MacBook uh, Pro has an, uh, or actually this has another USB-C port on it. You could hang a USB-C to HDMI, uh, you know, dongle adapter, whatever you want off of this and drive a second display. So, yeah, I think that would do it. I think that would do it. What do you think, John? Yeah, good. And that saves you a bunch of money. There. What's that? I have to look at all these stocks here and figure out which one to get, man. I know. It's crazy. It's great. It's we we love uh well for you, I would say the OWC they still sell the Thunderbolt 2 dock? They must. I'm right? looking at their list of products and I mean I think they're backwards compatible, so I can No. Thunderbolt. No, Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 2 are not. Oh right. no, no. The is, uh, right, because the uh connector, right? Because yeah, well, m among other things, uh the connector, yes. Yeah, so you need a Thunderbolt 2 dock, which I'm not seeing on OWC's no. page. Oh, uh, man. Yeah, I know. You know, we say it in the ads all the time that OWC is the first place that we go. It It's actually quite true. I mean, you, you're seeing the proof is in the pudding right here. We didn't. We'll see. All docks. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll search later. Oh, no, here you go. I found the OWC Thunderbolt 2 dock. I'll put a, uh, I'll put a link in the, in the show notes for oh. it. So um, it's 229. And it's yeah. got, yeah, gobs and gobs of ports and all the stuff you would need. So. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe it'll just, uh, yeah. you know, talk Good. to them. Yeah. Maybe they'll. Uh... Good luck with that. Yeah. I mean, may maybe. <laughs> no, seriously, maybe, but but not always with them. So, yeah. yeah. They don't always. It, 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 just to be clear, John's talking about perhaps they would they would give them something as a review unit or something. Uh, it, sometimes, yes. Um, but. Oftentimes with OWC and, and, and lot, they, they are not alone in this. They don't necessarily, they certainly will send stuff out, but it's, you know, on a 30 day review or things like that. So, um, no, I don't I know if their it. policies have the changed. Thing is, I mean, if it's something that I'm going to use and it's like, you know, a hundred bucks, then it's like, yeah, hey, I mean, it's always it. nice to get free gifts, but of course. Yeah. On the other hand, you know, I mean, I, I, I like to reward people for their good work and, yeah. uh, and they do good work. They do good work. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. So that would be the answer. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Well, see, Greg answered a question or Greg asked a question that we didn't even know we needed answered. See, we always <laughs> say we all learn five new things and we mean that, <laughs> that we are involved in this. All right. Uh, let's see. We have a CarPlay question from listener Scott who writes, he says, I have CarPlay in my 2014 Silverado. That's a, that's an old vehicle for CarPlay. It's not that old a vehicle. It's just old for CarPlay. Uh, it says that works when I plug my iPhone 6 Plus into the USB slash CarPlay port. One of the issues with using CarPlay is that it's draining the iPhone's battery and not keeping the charge. 
This is a problem when you're, I'm using Waze and other battery draining apps. To get around this, I'm using a Bluetooth connectivity uh, solution and connecting the phone to the cigarette lighter or power port. Do they still call it a cigarette lighter? Well, maybe. Uh, he says, is this just Chevy's implementation of CarPlay or is there a setting I am missing? So um, it sounds like your car's USB port does not pro provide enough power. I, uh, I, I mentioned in a recent episode that I uh, traded in a 2011 BMW X3 that I had for since 2011 and uh, and now have a 2018 uh, Subaru Outback. The latter of which has CarPlay, the former of which uh I had did not have CarPlay because that didn't exist in 2010 or whatever it was when this came out. But uh, but it did have BMW's sort of BMW apps solution and the built in USB port that would connect to the apps really didn't provide a ton of power. It provided some. And I found that most of the time it would provide enough power to sort of keep the phone in stasis, right? Like it wouldn't lose power, but it certainly wouldn't add power. And if I was doing anything with the phone, then of course I would lose power. So it sounds like you might be in that same scenario because not all cars have this problem. In fact, I would say most cars that I've used with CarPlay uh, will charge my phone all the way up, you know, within a matter of whatever, an hour, however long it would normally take. So, yeah, I think this is your your Silverado's issue. And it's worth having one of those inline, uh, you know, USB power meters so that you can see how much power that's giving it versus say something that you plug into your cigarette lighter slash power port and see what you get there. But, um, but yeah, yeah. So that's, that's where, that's where I am on it. Do you have any thoughts to add to that, John? No, I'm behind the times on this technology. I'm sorry. This your your car doesn't have you your car wouldn't have USB ports either so yeah that would have been that would have been no, quite prescient of them when they built it twelve volt uh, as we call it uh, cigarette lighter port which I do have things plugged into sometimes things that melt your phones but hopefully yeah not but again. now I have the thing you gave me oh that's good that's good hopefully that doesn't yeah. melt your phone yeah no I don't think so no you gave me a yeah if you recall I think it's a Microsoft branded two point oh, one amp dual port. Yep. And uh, it works great. Good. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 It didn't melt my stuff like that other cheap yeah. device. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Moving on to, uh, to Jeff. Jeff has a question about photos. He says, I recently replaced my old iMac with a new iMac. And realized that after about five generations of setting up my new Mac with my time machine backup or migration assistant, I am loaded down with cruft. Hence, I want to do a new clean install and just restore my data only. I need to know how to save all of my photos metadata. I've spent way too many hours manually entering the data and I don't want to do it again. Is there a way to preserve this metadata? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I it, Unless I'm mistaken... Well I, I think all well, of let's ask a question here. So well, let me, I, let me, let me answer. Let me answer by metadata. Okay, go. go. Yeah, then we can talk about what metadata. You're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think all of this metadata, which will come with a future definition uh, is stored in your photos library. So when, and that's a, it's a folder, but Mac OS treats it as a package by default. It is in your home folder inside pictures and it's called photos library. Uh, and or maybe iPhoto library converted or something, but th whatever it is, you know, you can look in photos in preferences and it'll tell you which one it's using. Copy that over to your new Mac and all of your data, your photos and all of your metadata, which John is going to uh, explain in a moment here. It should go with it. Uh, do you do you agree with that part, John? Yes. OK, cool. Uh, so now, please for everyone listening, explain metadata, if you would, please. Well, the thing is, I, 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 you could understand that term in one of two ways. So one is that any modern camera includes additional data with a photo, and it's typically called EXIF, which I forget what it stands for. It doesn't matter, but it's all the parameters that were used to... Um, or, or, 
you know, the lens, the resolution, the size of it, the ISO, the the focal length, the uh, exposure, f-stop, all that stuff that uh, you know, photography people got all excited about. Exchangeable That's EXIF data, but then exchangeable it, image file format is EXIF. Right, and it's and it's pretty much a standard among all modern cameras. So if you take a picture on one camera and then you try to load it into another piece of photo software. Um, it should see that data. Um, but then I think what he means by the metadata is that, so if you go into the latest version of photos and you highlight a photo and then you click on the info box, you're not only going to see the EXIF data represented within that window, but there's a lot of other things. And I think this is the data he's talking about. So uh, right now I just have a photo up here and a lot of it is blank for this one photo because I didn't define any things, but it says add a title, add a description, add a keyword, add faces, add a location or assign a location. And I think that's the data he's talking about. And if you stick with Apple products, then I think you'll be fine. Are you with me on this? I am totally with you. Yeah. Okay. And that, that yeah. I think is the, the additional data that he's talking about. So you're going to have to stay within the Apple ecosystem to preserve that additional data, whereas the EXIF data, that, that's going to come over. But I don't think that was what he meant when he said metadata. I think he meant the other stuff that, you know, puts your photos into perspective. So, you know, if you want to search for, you know, super duper, whatever, if you didn't name the photo, I mean, that's one way to organize things. But um, most cameras generate things with uh, some weird... You know, like even now I'm looking IMG underscore 0590 HEIC. That's not too, uh, too descriptive. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but in addition to that, Photos actually has a bunch of other things that aren't stored in the photos themselves that are just stored like your albums. And and even other data, I think, is is not necessarily stored in the photos themselves. It's not stored as EXIF, right? So there's there's metadata right, right. beyond that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and as you pointed out, I th- I believe you're correct. The uh, the package contains it. So it's additional data within the library or also known as a package file, which is it's buried in there somewhere. So Yeah. Yeah, it's right. It's buried in there somewhere. Yeah, just copy the whole thing over. You're good to go. Yeah. Or if you really or want to migrate it, well, or migrate it, you know, if you're moving to a new machine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can just copy it. Like that if you copy that package, you've got everything. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, if you want to, for whatever reason, if you don't trust that package anymore, you can, you could use something like iPhoto or uh, sorry, Power Photos, not, mm. you know, not iPhoto Library Manager, because that was the one for iPhoto, but Power Photos would let you sort of extract the data and move it into a new library. I, unless you're having a problem with your library, you have something going on where you know, yeah, I need to do that. I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. In our, uh, in our chat room here at MattKeekab.com slash stream, Dogster is saying, uh, if you go into photos and go to file export, checking the include title keywords and description and location information will get you uh, all of that type of data as well. So thanks, man. That's great. You rock for lots of reasons and you know, but uh, there you go. Cool. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Moving on to Gary's question. This, this might one be, rocks. This might I be a geek challenge, one. but maybe not. No, Sounds like John no, has an I, answer. I, okay, cool. Believe it or not. Awesome. Um, I was hoping. Uh, okay. So uh, Gary writes, when I woke up this morning, I noticed that my login plus the guest user choice appeared, which means my Mac rebooted overnight. I thought maybe we had a power failure at some point, but The Windows desktop my parents used was still on and nobody mentioned anything about having to reset clocks. Then shortly after I came back, I noticed a notification saying that an update was installed and with the usual close option on top. But the bottom uh, where it says details, clicking that only took me to the software update system preferences pane. And it told me uh, the last time it checked was just now and that my Mac was up to date. Where can I find out what updates were installed and what they fixed, added, or modified? So this is a great question. And as I said at the beginning of this, uh, to my knowledge, there's no update history, but I'm hoping I'm wrong and I'm looking forward to Mr. Braun dazzling us. 
with your ability to I'm find gonna razzle, just dazzle. these types of things. But this is the reason. Think- well, let me let me finish my my little. I'm just on a soapbox here for just one one Go. last second. Go. Yeah. So this is actually why I don't have auto update turned on 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 my machines, Mac OS or iOS, because I want to know what updates are coming. I like especially with iOS Agreed. apps. I want to like I and I update all the time. I'm 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 really kind of obsessive about it. But I like to read through the release notes on some of the apps because there might be a feature that was added or something that was changed and I want to know and if I had told it to auto update, I have no idea. So, that's why I have it off. But you're going to answer Gary's question. How do you know what's been applied? Now, you may think if you go to the App Store and you click on updates in the newly redesigned interface that you would have some data there about your recent updates, but sadly that data is not there. And right. that just makes me sad. So you may ask yourself, not only how do I work this, but you may ask yourself, where is a list of things that have been installed on my computer as of late? Right, Dave? Sure. And I'm going to tell you exactly where to go. So okay. get ready. I'm ready. About this Mac. Okay. System report. Software. Let me know when you're there. I'm there. All right, you see that item, installations? Yeah. Uh, okay. Here you go. Sort by install date. Huh. Okay. And look at that. Those are all the things. And actually, I'm looking on my Mac Mini, Dave. I have a list of things dating back to 2012, which is, I think, when I put this machine into service. This is a history. I think this is actually digging things out of a receipts folder. So when Mac OS installs something, it creates a receipts file or there's a receipts directory or something like that, right? Yeah. I don't know the details. It hasn't, it, but but it, it keeps track of where it's installed. Now, sadly, I don't know why they excluded that because I think the app store used to show the most recent updates. Huh. Right? Didn't it? Look at that. Yeah, man. This is great. So, uh, and again, I think that's digging through the receipt. The, the, there's some system folder that it's basically parsing and showing you and saying, okay, here's all the stuff. I mean, it has the version number, the source, whether it's Apple or third party, and the date that it was installed. But here's the cooler part, Dave. Uh oh. You can Uh-oh. see some of the sneaky things that Apple is doing, or, or the good things that Apple is doing. Like here, I see that Gatekeeper configuration yeah. data was updated on 2.8. What's Gatekeeper? Gatekeeper is one, of, I think it's their antivirus uh, uh, deal, right? It's their anti-malware deal. Yeah, exactly. Their anti-malware. Yep. Yes. Yep. So look at that. It kind of, because I think the, my machine, and I think most machines, is that you can say, install, system, uh, uh, I forget the exact uh, term here. Yeah. But there's a category of, and I think if you go to software update advanced, yep. Okay, here it is. Um, uh, you know. That's I think pretty I should good. Check this box. No, it's okay, the so install system data files and security updates is the checkbox that you're looking and for. And oddly enough, on this system, that box is not checked, but it looks like it did it anyways. Ooh. Hmm. Well, I have check for so there's five boxes here. Check for updates, download new updates when available, install Mac OS updates, install app updates from the app store, and install system data files. But it's not checked. But I think gatekeep unless yeah. it doesn't consider gatekeeper a system data file or security update. But I would recommend to people, I'm going to check that box right now, Dave, because that I think is something you do want to have. I've um, always left that checked. Yeah. 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 But that's interesting that yours did it without that box being checked. It makes me wonder. Well, if that's again, they don't thing. consider gatekeeper. Yeah. System data files or security, but I mean, I think it kind of is right. I think so. I thought so. I would have assumed so. Thing, I see MRT config data. I see so that too. Yeah, there's an SU. T- there's a lot of interesting things happening here. So if you want to know what your Mac's doing behind your back when you're not looking, huh. this is the. And I don't know why I just. I don't know. I was just. It's how you, it's I how your looking. brain works, man. I love it. That's great. Well, it's just like where can I look for this? It's like, yeah. is it? Oh, it has to be in system info. It's yeah. like, oh, of course it is. No, it's good. <laughs> it's good, man. That's good. All right. Uh, let's see. We have actually we have a bunch of follow ups from previous previous episodes to run through. But first, I want to thank all of the premium supporters that have contributed in the last couple of weeks. We've, it's been a few weeks since we've done this. So my apologies uh, for omitting it. We've had so much content that it just like, I don't know. Anyway, 
Yeah, here we are. So uh, for those of you that are interested in learning about our premium offering, you can go to MacKeekab.com slash premium. It's essentially a program really built at your urging. Uh, for those of you that want to support the show directly, you certainly can. We appreciate it. Uh, it is not mandatory, as you've probably figured out by now. We're happy to answer everyone's questions, but people that do support the show get a special premium at MacKeekab.com email address that they can use. And we do prioritize that some weeks like this one. Actually, there's about 51 and a half weeks of the year where we answer every question. This week was not one of them. So we will get to the rest of them. We're not going to just let them go. But uh, but, you know, we prioritize the premium stuff, among other things. You you know, you help us. We help you. It's, it's how it goes. So I want to thank. All the folks that contributed, I'll start with the one time uh, contributions, Tim T for 25 bucks, Ken M for 100 and Robert S for 50. So thanks to the three of you. You rock on our monthly $10 plan. We have Jeff F, Gary B, Joe BP, Tony Z, Ev the Nerd, Robert D, Nick S, Stephen B, Beth B, Ward J, Olga P, Jason A, Stephen A, Jason T, Chris S actually at $20 a month, uh, Paul M, Mike C, Mark R, Chris F, Bob at Working Smarter for Mac Users, Ryan M, Neil L, Scott F, Dave C, James C, J C, no relation amongst the three of them, Joe S, Frank A, Abdullah B, Ari L, Michael P, Barry F, Bob L, different Bob L than before, Jeff P, John V, John D, Santiago M, Ken L, Dave G, Clive S, Scott G, and Jim M. So thanks to all of you. And I didn't count how many there were, but thank you. You rock. And on the biannual $25 every six month plan, we would like to thank Antonio B, Brett H, Terrence N, Warren R, Kurt W, Joe M, Robert P, Karen K, Richard S, Jeff F, Lewis R, Brian G, David P, Mike M, Frank F, John I, Ian P, Mary G at 100 every six months, Corey A, Richard B at 30 every six months, Michael P, Andy W, Craig S, Joel F, Teresa B, Norton B, no relation, Edward W, John P at 50 every six months, Dan E, John O, Tony G, Richard J, Avram M, uh, Paul W, Gary T, Ron G, Dennis J at 30, Bruce M, Greg H, Anthony N, Deb L, Eddie M, Mark S, Walter H, Robert T, Graham R, I told you it'd been a few weeks. James M, Eric D, George D, Cindy K, Racer G, Tom H at 75, Mark E at 100, Tony C, Michael E, Ben H, Mark S, Brett P, Michael D, Dionisio Y, Ralph M, Dan B, Tim M, Will S, Joe K, Jim K, Robert F, David H, not me, Carl B, Louis Michel, Joshua O, Peter P, Paolo B, and Margaret M, you all rock. So thank you. And again, MacKeekab.com slash premium is where you can go if you are interested in joining all these great people in supporting us directly. If you're not or if you can't, if you, even if you are interested, but you aren't able, that's OK. We love your questions. We love your tips. We love all that stuff. And that's really why I always hate it when I can't get through everything, because um, we really do appreciate all of your questions. And it's you know, it's what keeps the keeps things going here. So it's pretty, pretty awesome. All right. Now. Jumping in and let's see if we can get through all of these tips and follow ups from previous shows in show 746. We were talking about um, ways to find out whether your disk was created. Your APFS disk was created directly with APFS or migrated from HFS plus to APFS. And uh, Keith says my MacBook had to go into Apple for a new keyboard. Uh, so I took a super duper backup and then did a system restore and fresh install of Mojave, including formatting the drive fresh as APFS. When I got it back with a spanking new keyboard, I've restored my super duper backup. But when I run disk first aid, I don't see formatted by new FS APFS. Mine says formatted by disk management D he says, I know I formatted this as APFS from within disk utility as part of the recovery process. So just another data point, and I appreciate you sharing that, Keith. That's great. Yeah, so disk management D. I, th I think the one is when it's convert uh, from HFS or whatever that one exactly is, that's that's the one that uh, 
that means it was converted in uh you may or may not have any issues. Certainly the drives that we've heard about having issues have been those that have been converted. So actually two weekends ago, I converted this machine to not be converted anymore. I wiped it. I did the, the, the exactly oh, the same thing. He okay. Did. Yeah. Yeah. Just to I'm gonna say, I'm going to throw in a little piece of data here is that it may have in fact been formatted by disutility. I'm sure it was. He did. He did it himself. Right. All, yeah. all I'm saying is that here, here's a, a little data point just to, if you want to go down the rabbit hole, yeah. go into terminal and type man disk management T. Oh, and it's going to give yeah. you a little manual page telling you that it's basically the process that this utility and other things talk to. That's but right. I, yeah. I, I thought it was interesting. I'm like, oh, it ends in a D. So that must be like a system level process. Yep. Let's. And that happens for a lot of things. So if you see things in your um, either ISTAT menus or activity monitor or something, and it's something that ends in a D, go to the terminal, type in man, a space, and then the name of that thing. And you may get some information about what the heck it is. Yeah. Just so you. For sure. Yep. Make sure it's not something evil. That's right. That's right. Uh, in the last episode, 747, uh, Stephen writes, it was mentioned that in notes, only the first page of a PDF is viewable without sharing to another app first. He says, well, in iOS, you can just tap and hold on the PDF and then can scroll through the whole thing. It seems normal and the expected behavior to me he says, I don't remember having an issue when I first use it. Uh, I guess that they long touch is effectively doing quick look for iOS. You are absolutely right, Stephen, that that is how sure. quick look works on iOS says this is the same with other attached multi-page doc multi documents and notes. What makes it seem different is that you may choose to show the attachment as a small or large icon. With the latter for a PDF, that's the first page. PDF is, I think, treated differently because of the close relationship between PDF and the Quartz Composer. It says, here's the interesting thing. On the Mac, you do exactly the same thing in notes. Select the attachment, see only the first page, press the space bar, and Quick Look shows you the whole thing. So yeah, quick look to the rescue. Thanks, Stephen. That's great. That's a, a great follow up on that. I and still it makes think sense. their implementation on the Mac is lame. <laughs> At least it's consistent, right? Because the Finder is the same way. You know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, no. I see what you're saying is that yeah, the, it, it, whatever platform you're on, implementing Quick Look yes. lets you see all the pages. I just think it's it's lame that you can't see. You should be able to see all the pages with with the native UI and not have to do something special. I, That's just my feeling. But yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Do I have this one? Uh, I thought I had a good question here. There it is. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we had been talking with listener David about not being able to use uh, his keyboard on his iPad when the iPad was shut down or it would, when it would go to sleep, it would wake up and his Bluetooth keyboard would, uh, would not persist. Well, he says, so often the simplest things are hidden until you know where to look. He says, if going into settings, face ID and passcode, USB accessories needs to be green or on. Uh, and that allowed the keyboard uh, to persist. And that's it. So it, uh, sorry, not a Bluetooth keyboard, a USB keyboard uh, to persist. It just by turning that on, it kept it alive and you are good to go. So very cool. Thank you, David, for for uh, sharing that good stuff. Craziness, huh, John? Crazy, crazy. All right. Uh, let's see. Moving along to. Michael, uh, who has a couple of things to share, actually. Uh, first is he says uh, regarding CarPlay, I bought a used 2012 Honda Accord and installed a CarPlay capable radio myself. And these are available aftermarket radios uh, with CarPlay or head units, as we call them now. He says, I also installed a backup camera and it all works great. With iOS 12, my podcast will play for two to three minutes through CarPlay. Then the audio will stop while the counter still shows it is playing. The silence lasts for about 30 seconds. Then the audio resumes with those 30 seconds missing. If I press pause and then play, the audio restarts immediately. It says I've sent Apple a movie of this and hopefully they will fix it. It happens in four different podcast players, Overcast, Castomatic, RSS Radio, and of course, Apple's. They all act the same way. Well, the good news is Michael followed up with us. 
And he says Apple, Apple recommended using the latest public beta, which at the time he sent this sent us this email about a week ago was 12.2.2 he says. So I did. And that fixed it. He says, so I've reported that. And hopefully in the next release, this problem is solved. So that's uh, if anyone is having CarPlay issues with uh, with with that in particular, it's fixed. Just either install the public beta or wait and install it when it's when it's out. It depends on how important that is to you. So pretty good. Thanks, Michael. Good stuff. Any thoughts on this, John, before we uh, wrap up with these? My only CarPlay issue is I don't have it. Mm. It really but is quite spectacular. But it's interesting to hear, maybe I will install a radio. It depends it if you it. if you have a head unit. I, I don't know where. I, I wonder how that would work in your car, because you don't have like a, a a spot for a screen, right? And and so you would need one in order to no, use CarPlay. No, I got Car a Play. slot for a traditional radio which mine also came with right a cassette i mean i got that too right but you know, but I mean, carplay pretty... needs a, a screen right i mean carplay that's really right. all carplay is is a screen or that's the main part of carplay so i wonder yeah i wonder so how you have to swap out the radio and then probably would have to run and you know i think i saw some people at ces yes there was at least one company that yes i think had that so i would have to get like a heads-up display or something yeah, um, it would it would be a screen because it needs to be a touch screen for CarPlay right, right. to work. Yeah, yeah. Right. Plus, so I have to get a radio unit that you know the size of that is standard, but then I have to run a screen somewhere. So yeah, eh, not too complicated. Yeah, as long as it exists. I the ones I've seen are all like you know ball in one kind of things that replace whatever screen you've got, and also add the backup camera, which is you know super actually right, super right. handy. It, that that's one of the best things they've put in cars in the last, you know, whatever, 10 years or whatever. Oh, yeah. Those backup cameras. It's yeah. Great. Well, it's always good not to yeah, run over things. Yeah. My car will actually stop me from backing up if it senses another car, you know, like in a parking lot or whatever. You're backing out and somebody's coming along. It'll actually stop me it, even if I couldn't see it. It's pretty so cool. Is it, so is your so, sonar or is it just visual? Uh, both. Yeah. It's, it's okay. Because yeah, yeah, you want to have both. a backup thing. Yeah. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. So sound wave, if it sees a thing in the way. Yeah. Well, that's a good feature. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's great. All right. Uh, I think we have, well, we've got a couple of tips. Uh, one last follow up from previous shows. Um, in 744, Mike, Mark writes, at the end of the episode, you talked about not getting sound on the questioner's iPhone when a notification happened. This made a bell go off in my head with something that was also driving me crazy. You said that if you're wearing an Apple watch, it could be sending the notification to the watch first, prioritizing that and not buzzing your phone. He says, when I, well, I purchased an iPhone XS Max recently and was told that my Apple Watch Series 0 would not work with it. Indeed, most functions do not work. But I never thought the reason I was not hearing any sounds on my iPhone from notifications was because I still had it set up from my last iPhone to ping my Apple Watch. So I turned notifications off for the watch, and now I get sound and notifications on my iPhone again. After I recover from the second mortgage for the iPhone purchase, it will be time to get a new watch. So yeah, the watch can definitely be the thing that, that grabs those notifications uh, before they ring anywhere else. Apple tries not to buzz you multiple places for their own notifications, and uh, sometimes they succeed, perhaps too much. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, there you go. Uh, let's see. I think we can squeeze these malt, these last three tips in. Maybe James writes. Uh, I have heard you talk about using the combo update package to correct ills that other methods have not been able to fix. Well, I can attest to this working for me. In fact, I wonder if this would have worked for your issue that we started the show with, John. He says, my wife has a 2017 iMac that's been slow to boot from the time she got it. At first, I blamed this on the 5400 RPM disk drive that I mistakenly let her purchase to save some money. I figured it might be slower than the 2007 iMac uh, with an SSD I had installed. It was replacing, but I did not expect it to be as slow as it was. What exacerbated the problem was that it took three minutes or more to get to the Apple login screen. My backup plan was if performance became an issue, I would move the boot disk to a USB Gen 2 external SSD connected via Thunderbolt 3. 
I eventually went that route and once booted performance was very good, but the time to get to the login screen was still three minutes or more while researching and trying many things to improve boot performance. I found a reply from someone who experienced a similar problem. They solved it by updating the iMac using the combo updater. So I did that. Lo and behold, time to boot or boot time to login screen dropped to approximately one minute. Needless to say, we are pleased. So, yeah, very cool that it's a good reminder that the combo update can solve a lot of problems. Um, not only does it sort of do the dance that happens when you do an install and wiping out the cache files and all that, but it does install all of the components that are new since the, you know, point zero version of that OS doesn't replace everything like, like John's update did, but it replaces a lot of things and that may, uh, may do it. So thank you for sharing that, James. That's great. Pretty cool, huh, John? So did, so when you update from recovery, is that a combo update or a full update? I'm not no, sure. that, that pulls down the full updater of the current version. So it's, it is okay. the, it it's, yeah, it's not the point zero. It's whatever the, you know, whatever the current release is. Yeah. 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 Yeah, because okay. that's the internet the, the recovery or whatever they call it. The only other thing I'd add here is that just because a disk is 5,400 RPM doesn't mean that it's slow. That's true. And that's that true. What you want to look at, so for any drive, what you want to look at it, and sometimes it's hard to get this, but from whatever vendor it is, get the data sheet and you want to find the raw throughput of the platter. And, and they use different terminology, but the thing is, you're probably not going to operate at the speed of the interface, the SATA, and it's probably a SATA 3, but you will be operating, you, you in theory, can operate at the speed that the pl data goes from the platter or the chips, if it's an SSD, to the interface. And that data is available. Um, and in theory, you can get a 5,400 RPM drive that, you know, kicks butt. But right. you right. got to look at the numbers. Yeah. Uh, 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 on the other hand, in general, yes, 5,400 is kind of, slow I, I think i've even seen slower drives like 2700 sometimes and i'm like what yeah. how'd you come up with this yeah yeah well, exactly. these days it's 54 or 72 or i don't know if, did i see a 10k drive i don't know but it's everybody oh yeah this for sure anyway, so oh there's matter. yeah 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 but but he's right like just get an ssd if you want to if you want to address that problem just get an ssd you know for especially for your boot drive yep oh yeah all right uh, let's see. Going to Jordan, who has a tip to share. He says, long time listener, first time caller. I wanted to share a quick tip. I came across today on my MacBook pro with touch bar. I'm a huge fan of using the terminal. And while I was running the software update command, I noticed that on touch bar and that, that is a command you can run from terminal software update, all one word, all lowercase. He says, while I was doing that, I noticed that on the touch bar, I had an icon come up that looks like a document with the name of the command next to it. Clicking on it or tapping on it brings up the man page for the current command in a new terminal window with a yellow background. This is super handy since it gives an easy to read man page in a separate window versus typing man before the command you wish to know about. And then that way you automatically have the man page up in a separate window and you can kind of go back and forth. That's pretty cool. I like, yeah, no, look at somebody at Apple thinking about the, uh, yeah. the touch bar in the terminal. I like it. It sounds like a, uh, that sounds like the title of the show, the touch bar on the terminal. It's like, it sounds like a great adventure. Someone could go on. I don't know. No, anyway. no I think so. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, one last little heads up is from Don who, yeah, it's a fish shake. He says, uh, I was getting, he, he wrote us and he was getting all kinds of I issues with, um, with corruption on his drive. And he says, I fixed all of this by eliminating the Microsoft OneDrive app and the folders associated with it. It involved a lengthy process, he says, of removing the app deleting the OneDrive folder from users and then cloning the drive with SuperDuper. Since I then booted from the SuperDuper clone, reformatted my Mac's hard drive as APFS and then cloned the SuperDuper back. I booted from the hard drive to make sure it booted, then booted the Mac from its recovery partition, ran disk utility, which ran first aid with no errors or warnings. 
He says, I was clued into the problem with OneDrive uh, by referencing the following website. Somebody on user voice talked about this issue. He says the, uh, the threads in the discussion indicate a problem uh, with that. Whatever is causing disk utility to return a warning message corrupts the time machine backup. I can confirm that this is a problem that I noticed with my new MacBook Air when attempting to correct its SSD by reinstalling Mac OS again and then migrate my data from time machine. It failed partway through the migration. The warning message is therefore critical. Anyone who is running Microsoft OneDrive app should run Disk Utilities First Aid from the recovery partition ASAP. If warnings occur, get rid of the OneDrive app and the associated folders and recreate the Mac from a clone. So thanks for sharing that, Don. That's um, that's craziness. We will put uh, we will put a link in the show notes, of course, because uh, you know that's how we roll here. But yeah, that's crazy, man, huh? That's not. Uh, not so good, but uh, at least now we know. So there you go. Thanks, and Microsoft. Th- thanks, Microsoft. Thanks, Dan, really. Don, sorry, I had, had your name wrong. Don. <laughs> uh, that's what I get for looking quickly. Well, we didn't make it through everything on the agenda, but we made it through a lot, John, and I feel pretty good about that. So I think there's only mm-hmm. like four or five things left that we had to skip, one of which we were going to skip anyway because it turned out to be incorrect. But, you know. What? There you go. We try to we try not to share incorrect data. So who's one incorrect? Of, one of the tips we've we never got. been incorrect. We've been incorrect so many times. It's ridiculous. That's what I love about our community <laughs> is like folks help us. We get it right in the end. Wow. That's the idea. Yeah, you're right. Every yeah, time. yeah. No, it's good. That's I I I actually love being wrong because it means I'm going to learn something. That's like it's the best. It really, well, is. and it means that somebody's paying attention, which. That too, yeah. If you do anything in your life, pay attention to what's going on around you. That's, yeah. There you go. It's good. Sweet. Maybe do something about it. Maybe do complain. something about it. That's Don't right. Yeah, Coolio. Which, but if you want to as complain, Jeff points out, is artist Leon uh, Ivy Jr. But, you know, there you go. But if you want to complain, or you have a question, or you have a tip, or pretty much, you know, if you just want to feel like it, Dave, I think one thing that people could do is send an email to feedback at MacGeekab.com. That's feedback at MacGeekab.com for all of you that weren't paying attention the first time. Mm-hmm. And and at least this time, Dave, you got it right in that it's feedback at MacGeekab.com. And you can visit us on our forums at MacGeekab.com slash forums. We'd love to see you there. We'd love to hang out with you there. We'd love to answer your questions. We can share tips. It's like MacGeekab goes all week long right there at MacGeekab.com slash forums. <laughs> we want to thank all of you, of course, for sending in all your tips and everything. This, this episode was chock full. It was good. Uh, I'll thank you, Mr. John F. Braun, because uh, without you, the show would uh, not be the same at all. It'd it would be, be half terrible. the show... It'd half, half the time the it'd be half the show half the time i don't know what that means but it it rolls off the tongue so that's what we say that could be the episode maybe. half the show yeah. half the time no this show took almost th- this will be longer than most of double our shows. The show double the time there you go no. uh half the show double the time <laughs> double the show half the double the show half the time no there we go. no we still mm-hmm. have a lot of time and, and the more we do this, the longer we take. Uh, I want to thank Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com for providing all the bandwidth that gets the show from us to you. Of course, I want to thank our sponsors, ExpressVPN.com slash MGG, uh, where you can get three months free as part of that one-year package. Barebones.com, where you can get BB Edit. Uh, SmileSoftware.com slash podcast. Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. Uh, let's see, opsgenie.com, eero.com slash mgg. I think the slash mgg thing still works now, even though, uh, Amazon took them over. Hopefully. Looks like it. Yeah, exactly. Have a, uh, have a good time all the time. Have a good evening or day or noon or whatever time it is you're choosing to listen. And, um... Yeah, don't get caught. Made up.